Good Sabbath, brethren. It's truly a good thing to be able to be here to serve Almighty Yahweh, serve the brethren, and to be part of this great ministry here in the end of the age. I am sure most of you have noticed that we're dealing with a lot of 1980 sermons. We actually came across a box in the archive that uh, I previously hadn't seen. And as I mentioned many times to people that ran the audio before me, I'm not sure if they weren't concerned about archiving or what the deal was, but after they would make the cassette tape, they'd crash the master. But it may have been Eldermeyer's instruction to maintain that, that 1980 box and to make sure that the, the original masters were there because of the tumultuous time the Assemblies of Yahweh went through. But as you're able to see now and the way the Assemblies of Yahweh is run, that was a very formative time in Elder Meyer's leadership in the Assemblies of Yahweh and the guidance of Yahweh because what he did is he separated this ministry from all the other pagan uh, idolatry, uh, the, the pagan misled groups out that, in the world that seem to focus on idolatry. And what it does is it puts a great responsibility on each and every member of the Assemblies of Yahweh. So yes, as Deacon Jeff said, we're able to to uphold the teachings in the Assemblies of Yahweh, but it's uh, really an honor and a privilege to be able to be here to study with brethren of like precious faith and to learn the things that have been given to us so freely in the Assemblies of Yahweh. And I really think we need to remember that and allow it to be impressed on our life because we are able to see then a continuation of the teaching and the message that we're gonna hear this morning is uh, along those lines. It's a continuation the doctrines that we have today, a continuation from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And it's just such an inspirational thing that we're able to witness every day, and we're so thankful to be here. So again, good Sabbath, head deaconess Ruth Meyer, and to the assembled brethren here in Bethel and around the world. It's an overcast and cool day, but as Brother Brukia read the Abib song this morning, psalm this morning, the weather has changed and the ground is growing, and Yahweh is pouring out his blessings. So let's accept them. And let's grow not only physically, but in the physical sense, but especially in the spiritual as we're counting our way toward Feast of Weeks. The title of the message this morning is A Higher Calling. We talk about a higher calling all the time. Judaism talks about a higher calling. We are concerned about a calling on high, and that's what the topic of the message is going to be about. This higher calling that we anticipate hearing from Almighty Yahweh's King, his son, our Messiah, when he returns. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, let's begin in verse 35 and let's begin to consider the topic of being called on high. But some will say, how are the dead raised? And with what manner of body do they come? You foolish one, that which you yourself sow is not made alive except it die. And that which you sow, you sow not the body that, will, that shall be, but it bare grain, it may chance of weed or of some other kind, but Yahweh gives it a body even as it pleased him, and to each seed a body of his own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one flesh of man, another flesh of beasts, and another flesh of birds, and another of fishes. There are also, there are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It's raised in power. And it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is also written that the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, that is not the first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Then that which is spiritual. The first man is a man of earth, earthy. The second man is of the heavens. As is the earthy, so are they also that are earthy. And, it, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. 
Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then the saying shall come to pass that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to Elohim who gives us the glory, the victory through our sovereign Yahshua, the Messiah. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of Yahweh, knowing that your labor is not vain in Yahweh. What an inspirational passage as we read this letter to the Corinthian assembly. We can take instruction today to understand more of what's taking place in our lives that we see taking place uh, happening around us. We have a physical body, but we're looking forward to the time of the future with the heavenly. And all these things then can come together without Yahweh's instruction to keep us maintaining a direct onward path. I love how he ends the passage. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of Yahweh, knowing that your labor is not in vain. If we continue to grow in Yahweh's grace, and if we continue to apply his words, then the goal can be attained. It can be reached by a group of individuals who are the bride of the Messiah. It always amazes me whenever you read the sacred scriptures how patently clear Yahweh's word is. And when you witness to an individual or you you talk to them and they say, I don't understand what the Bible's trying to tell me, it's because you're trying to insert yourself into Yahweh's word. If you just listen to what Yahweh's trying to tell us and show us by the uh, inspired writers that have put down these words before us, then you're able to understand the harmonious method that Yahweh has given us his word. As the... As Brother Bruke, the individual led the devotions, he said, we're thinking about this time period going through the wilderness toward the mount. And that's what we're doing. We're going through the wilderness, counting day by day toward the mount of Yahweh, learning from the things that happen, but knowing that Yahweh is leading us to a certain and a specific place. I remember Elder Meyer saying the reason he preaches the way he does is he, he would close every door and hammer every door closed. If his mind would come into a passage and not be able to explain it, he would study. He'd go back to the original languages and say, this is what the Bible is trying to tell me. And then by doing that, he was able then to preach with that doubt that he had in his mind that Yahweh proved and closed those doors. So then he was able to relay that to the assemblies of Yahweh, very comprehensive manner of teaching. But it's only a manner of what we already have in the sacred scriptures. You look at how Paul wrote about the physical and the spiritual body and how we came, keep coming back to it. You know, here we have this example, and then we come back to it. Now, what are we supposed to do with the dead rising? And then he preaches, and then he comes back to it. And we have the physical and spiritual, so what are we supposed to do? And that's a, a very inspirational way of explaining the words of Yahweh, because then all the words come together into a, an instruction manual that we can use. Yeah, open a box. You get an Amazon box, whoever has got an Amazon box in the United States. You get an Amazon box and you have instructions that come with it for assembly. You don't go to the last page and start on step number 24. You start on step number one. And that's what the sacred scriptures does for us. The passage I want to concentrate on and pull out of this passage that we read this morning is verses 50 uh, through 52, 50, 51, and 52. Let's consider these words. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. Now, what he does is he draws a specific line. When you have a modifier that is so clear and blunt, then it makes a line. Okay, so here we have flesh and blood. Here's the kingdom of Yahweh. This line cannot be crossed, is what Paul's saying. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. Now what the world tries to do is it says, yes, it can. You can live the way you want to do, the the way you want to live. You can do the things you want to do, and you can still make it into heaven. 
Paul's drawing a very specific line, and let's look at that a little bit closer. Neither does uh, corruption in, uh, inherit in corruption. You can't have these two things blending and mixing. What he's doing is drawing a specific line between the flesh and blood, between our physical life and between our spiritual life. And we have to understand that there's only one way that that line can ever be crossed, that the physical can ever cross into the spiritual is by the direction of Almighty Yahweh. You see one of those instances in Genesis chapter 32, where Abram is sitting, where Jacob is sitting there, and the angels of Yahweh met Jacob. And when he saw them in verse 2, Genesis 32, 2, when Jacob saw them, he said, this is Elohim's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. He didn't go up there, talk to them. He didn't, well, eventually he did, yes. But he was able to understand by just seeing them that this is Yahweh's host and there are two camps. That's what Mahanaim means, to have two camps. Another specific description of this and even more plainly uh, and clearly written down for us today, is in 2 Kings 6. 2 Kings 6, and we'll begin in verse 15. And when the servant of the man of Elohim had risen early and gone forth, behold, an army of horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Here was a physical army that was, had encompassed the city and had them, uh, had them, was trying to... Uh, subdue them. He's, and then his servant said, what are we going to do? In verse 16, he said, fear not, for they that are with us are more than they that are with them. Now, we hear that all the time today, don't we? You know, you know when you have a sickness, well, trust in Yahweh. Well, that's just a word, right? The word then turns into faith. We say, you know, we have the kingdom of Yahweh coming. We know how to, we were going to striving to get there. And we know what we have to do because Yahweh gave us his word. That's just a, a word from almighty Yahweh that we receive. And then our mind draws the conclusion. So here Elisha is telling the servant, the more, the, there's more people on our side than on their side. And the servant was probably <laughs> undoubtedly saying, oh yeah, sure. But then Elisha prayed, Yahweh, I pray you open his eyes. Elisha's faith was so strong that he had already envisioned this. He was already able to see the forces of Almighty Yahweh. Open his eyes, the servant, that he may see. Yahweh opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, what was this encompassing camp circling? It wasn't circling the other army. It wasn't protecting the city. Remember Yahshua coming up and asking the angel, whose side are you on? He said, no, I'm on, I'm on the side of Almighty Yahweh. It encircled the man of Elohim on earth because that man of Elohim was the one on earth that was upholding Yahweh's word. This servant then was able to envision with his envision, yes, in his mind through the words, but then with his actual eyes, be able to see the two camps of Almighty Yahweh. The only way you can see to cross that physical and spiritual line is Almighty, Yahweh, Almighty Yahweh's gift. You see it very clearly there in Kings, how Yahweh opened the eyes of the servant and he was able to see those things. Now, how do we think today that we're ever able to cross the line out of the physical into the spiritual without the movement of Almighty Yahweh? as a special gift, as a gift for a, righteous, a faithful servant. The world tries to muddle the water, muddy the waters again and muddle everything up together. But just allow the Yahweh's word to speak and allow him to talk to you. So back in 1 Corinthians 15 again, Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. Now in verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. The word mysterion in the Greek is to close your mouth, to shut your mouth. It's a secret. Okay, now the world tries to say, you got to believe what I'm telling you. It's a mystery. They always want to say it's a mystery. You just got to believe what I'm telling you, even though the Bible doesn't say it because it's a mystery. That's not what the word is in Greek. It's a secret. Remember in Hebrews 11, 
all these faithful individuals of old that had this and, and held this great faith of Almighty Yahweh never experienced the resurrection, experienced eternal life. But they went to their death knowing that that was going to take place. It was a secret that they weren't open to and they weren't allowed to understand. But Yahweh was not going to forget them. That's where their faith comes in. And that's what he, Paul's saying here. I'm going to tell you a mystery. Now, none of us have experienced this mystery. It's a, set, it's a special secret how Yahweh is going to do it. But we know that it's going to take place. That we shall not all sleep. As you're able to see many times through the passage, this is talking about a dead individual being resurrected. Up in verse 35 again, how are the dead raised? So we're not all going to be dead when Yahshua returns. We're not all going to sleep. But we shall be changed. There's a transformation. And we have a spiritual transformation when we're baptized. But coming up out of the water of baptism, standing before the presbytery, the elders, and receiving the down payment of Yahweh's Holy Spirit, we are then able to live a spiritual life, but we are still in the flesh. We still sin, we still fail, Almighty Yahweh, and we need Yahshua's blood to cover them, cover our sins. So we're not all going to sleep, but we shall be changed. This is a physical change from a physical body to the spiritual. In a moment, a quick amount of time, it's going to be instantaneous. When Yahweh opened the eyes of that servant, it was instantaneous. He was able to see the, the surrounding armies. At this period of time, it's going to be instantaneous. And then when is this going to take place? At the last trumpet. So at the last trumpet, when Yahshua returns, this, will, this change is going to be experienced not only by the dead that have faithfully lived, but also by the ones that are alive at that period of time that are living a righteous life, a faithful life. At the last trumpet, the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Right now there's bones laying in the grave. And it, they're waiting for that regeneration from on high from Almighty Yahweh. That's a corruptible body, something that was living and then has now decayed and is sitting in a corruptible state. But when that last trumpet sounds, that body in the grave is going to be regenerated by Almighty Yahweh and will be brought forth. Those of us that are alive, even though we are in the flesh in a corruptible manner, at that last trumpet at the same time, we will be changed into the spiritual, those that have gone before us and those that are living at, during that last trumpet are all going to be changed to allow the flesh to go away and to live then a spiritual life. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for that trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this, this mortal shall put on immortality. We shall be changed at the last trumpet and that's the faith and hope that we have in Yahshua's imminent return. Why do you think that we long for Yahshua's return so dearly? Why do we keep our eyes on the kingdom of Yahweh and never want to turn back and allow Yahweh to change us? Because we want to be part of that great transformation. There's another passage of scripture that shakes it down even a little bit more, a little bit more clear and a little bit more concise. And you find that in 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13 begins, but we do not wish you, brethren, to be ignorant. This is an informative instruction that Paul is giving to the assembly of Thessalonica concerning them that fall asleep, that you sorrow not, even as do the rest, who have no hope. So there's a different kind of sorrow for those out in the world. Yeah, when an individual we love passes away, we're sorry, we're, we're sad, it, it breaks our countenance. But we also know and have that Re rebuilding seed of faith that we will be meeting them if we're faithful in the cloud during that last trumpet. Out in the world, they sorrow because that's it. They don't have any more hope. For if we believe that Yahshua died and rose again, okay, so he died and rose again on the third day, was in the grave, 
When the trumpet sounded, Yahshua rose. Even so them that have fallen asleep in Yahshua will Elohim bring with him. When that last trumpet sounds, he is going to be calling them out of the grave. He's going to be calling those that are alive at his coming to him. He's going to bring them with him. Now, where are they going to go? We're going to cover that in just a little bit. For this we say by the word of Yahweh. Now, what is the word of Yahweh he's speaking of? The first passage let's consider is Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37 shows that there is a land of dry bones. And these individuals in, that have uh, fallen asleep are going to be called out of the ground. In verse 12, therefore prophesy and say to them, you're saying to the whole house of bones, the whole house of Israel, thus says the sovereign Yahweh, behold, I will open your graves, the Kibberim, and I will cause you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Now, why in the assemblies of Yahweh do we keep our, our great concern on what's taking place in the land of Israel? Because Yahweh's eyes are on that land, and that's where he will be setting up the kingdom of Yahweh, be the government head of his kingdom on earth. He will open our graves and bring us into Israel. Verse 13, and you shall know that I am Yahweh. Yahweh's name is defined as eternity, everlasting life. When the graves are open and we're called up out of them, or if we're changed, as he says, the living changing from a corruptible to an incorruptible, mortal to immortality, at that point we will know Yahweh. We will know his power. We will understand what eternity is as he brings us into the likeness of his own self and that I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit in you and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. And you shall know that I, Yahweh, have spoken it and performed it. A secondary passage to this and a secondary instruction describes this return of Yahshua in Zechariah 14. In Zechariah 14, 4, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall divide in the middle of it, toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And you shall flee by the valley of my mountains, and for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azo. Yes, and you shall flee, like as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. And Yahweh, my Elohim, shall come, and all the holy ones with you. Here is a physical individual. Uh, I, should, I can't say physical, because Yahshua is going to be in the spiritual. Here is an individual, tangible individual, that is going to land on the Mount of Olives, and that mountain will divide in half, creating a valley which will allow the waters to go out from Yahweh's temple when it comes down to rebuild the Dead Sea. And he is not going to come alone. All the holy ones that have lived a life pleasing to him, that are called up out of the graves and are instantly changed at Yahshua's great trump of his return, are going to accompany Yahshua to that land and then his knowledge the knowledge of Almighty Yahweh will flow out all across the face of the earth. Let's turn back to 1 Thessalonians 4 again, and let's continue in verse 16. For Yahshua himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of Yahweh. And the dead in the Messiah shall rise first. And then we that are alive, that are left, shall together with them be caught up in the clouds. The word caught up is harpazo. It's number 726 in the Greek. It means to seize, to carry away by force, or to claim for oneself, or to snatch away. So the dead that are regenerated and the alive that are converted physically into a spiritual being are then caught away, they're snatched away from something. 
The word comes from 138, to choose or to save. Just like number 142, to lift up from 138 to 142, to lift up, to elevate from the ground. So how is this not so patently clear that when Yasha returns, his faithful ones will come to him as he comes down through the sky. And then he continues, Strong's continues, it's akin to the Hebrew word Nasal, 5375, to bear up or to lift oneself up, to rise up or to be swept away. Now in Genesis 18, we have the utilization of that word. In Genesis 18:1. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard what he had done for... Oh, I'm in Exodus. Excuse me. <laughs> I don't think Jethro is in Genesis 18. And Yahweh appeared unto him by the oaks of Mamre, and he sat in the, as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes. Now Saul, he lifted up his eyes, and what did he see? He saw three men that stood over against him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them, from the tent door. So he not saw, he lifted himself up, he saw three men that he identified as the men of Elohim, and he ran to meet them. He went out of his place of residence to a place to meet the man of Elohim. And when he, and, and he meet them at the tent door, from the tent door, and he bowed himself to the earth and said, Sir, if I have found favor in your sight, pass not away, I pray you, from your servant. Now let a little water be brought, wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. And I'll bring a morsel of bread and strengthen you your heart. After that you shall pass on, because you have come to your servant. And he said, and they said, do as you've said. And Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. So what he did is he lifted up, Nassau, he lifted himself up. He saw the man of Elohim. He went to that man of Elohim met with them, bowed himself, and worshipped him, and then they went back to his place of residence. It was a friendly encounter, and then a return. Just like when an individual comes to visit you at your house, you have a friendly encounter. A lot of times you hear the car pull up, you'll hear a dog barking, you'll go out front, oh, they're here. You go outside, unlock the door, go out to the front porch, and accompany them back into your house. This is exactly what the term harpazo is trying to tell you. It's a calling away, calling away out of this physical world into the world that Yahweh is preparing that is coming down from on high. In Luke 21, Luke 21, verse 28. <clears throat> Luke 21, 28 reads, but when these things begin to pass, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. Now what kind of things are taking place? What's he saying? When these things begin to take place, look across the page. Take heed, be not led astray by others in, uh, that are misusing the name. Nation, rising among nation, tumults, wars, being mistreated for the words of Almighty Yahweh, seeing the things that are done in the world and taking a stand against them. All these things are very important for us to know that the beginning of the birth pangs of the Messiah are taking place around us. Truly, the world has turned a blind eye to the words of Almighty Yahweh, and they're beginning to go down the road of destruction at an at a ever, at a ever quickening pace. It's just stunning to me to watch the news in the morning or the evening and to see what's taking place. You know, I, I can understand protesting. I, I understand lifting up your voice against something that you see as an injustice. But did, did you see the leader of the Columbia University protest actually on video said it and then went out and then wrote it and reconfirmed it? that the people in the land of Israel, Judaism, i.e. is what they're saying, do not deserve to be alive. Now, you know, there's a lot of sin out in the world, and Yahweh says they don't deserve to be alive, but there's nothing we can do about it. Yahweh's the Yahweh will take vengeance. 
to actually say that a group of individuals who just have blood need to be destroyed is a replay of what took place 80 years ago. Do we see the road that this world is on? Do we see the destruction that's coming? At what point is Yahweh going to have to stand and judge once again? Do we see how close we are to the end of the age? When we see these things, it should say, this is the beginning of travail. These things are actually taking place to have this Ukraine situation, to have the Gaza situation, the upheavals all over the world, nations rising against, against the land of Israel, against the United States, against each other. These are all, this has all been prophesied. And we had better wake up because we are too far down the road to start to deal with the stupid physical life that we're trying to get rid of. We should be so concentrating today on the spiritual. In point 20 of the Statement of Doctrine, we affirm that our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, will establish the kingdom of Yahweh, the kingdom of the heavens on this earth. Psalm 15, Proverbs 11, Matthew 5, and Revelation 5. The millennial kingdom will prevail for a thousand years and will be set up by Yahshua the Messiah at his second coming. The kingdom of Yahweh will be set up at his second coming. So what does the world do with the scriptures that we just covered this morning? What does the world do to try to substantiate their position and to mislead is what they're doing, the masses? They talk about the rapture, where a group of individuals is going to be taken away out of the situation that we find ourselves in, go up to heaven, sit there and watch all the turmoil of judgment during the tribulation, and then come down out of heaven. Now, by any qualification of the passages we read this morning, is that going to take place? They're missing every single point that Paul brought up in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4, because it all hinges on the last trumpet. In Luke 17, 22, Luke 17, 22, he says to his disciples, the days will come when you shall see, when you shall desire to see one of, the, one of the days of the Son of Man, and you shall not see it. And they shall say to you, lo there, lo here, go not away, nor follow after them. Be aware, let no man lead you astray. As for the lightning, when it flashes out of one part under the heaven, shines even to the other part under the heaven, so shall the Son of Man be on in his day. But we must suffer things until then. That's what he keeps on going. The first must he suffer many things and be rejected of the generation. And it shall come to pass as in the days of Noah shall be in the Son of Man. You know, they're going to be eating, they're drinking, they're giving him marriage. They were all doing this until the day that Noah was shut into the ark. Around us today, we see individuals eating and drinking themselves into oblivion. It's all they're concerned about. They live for the weekend. We see marrying and giving in marriage. Now, all my life, I've heard uh, individuals, ministers of the Assemblies of Yahweh, say about, look what, look what the divorce rates are. The divorce rates being high, you just... If you don't like something, you just change your spouse and keep going. Today, that's on steroids. Now you can get rid of your spouse. You can marry another same-sex individual. You can marry yourself. You can marry a doll, we saw in the news. It's insane and upside down. And it all took place till the day Noah was locked in the ark. And then Yahweh poured water down, and then as in Sodom and Gomorrah, that Luke continues to say, it all took place with fire, and that's how the earth is reserved. The word rapture, number one, is an expression or manifestation of ecstasy or passion. It's not a place, it's not a doctrine. This is an elevation of passion for something. Number two, a state of being carried away carried, that's where you get the apostle, with overwhelming emotion. Number three, a mystical, and it's a mysterious experience in which the spirit is exalted in a knowledge of heavenly things. That's what a rapture is. 
It's a time, it's, a, it's a, a, an experience that we have that transcends us for the small point of time from this physical to the spiritual. Now, those of us that have kept the feast day in this meeting hall have experienced that rapture where we are lifted up on the last great day to be so, feel so close to Almighty Yahweh that we are so dedicated to say this is where we are going and we are going to the kingdom of Yahweh. That is what the word rapture is describing. In uh, number 10 in the songbook, A Child of the King, the word rapture is there. There's actually questions come up occasionally. There's people that actually won't sing that word. It's not talking about a rapture going up into heaven. It's talking about having a spiritual experience in a physical body where Yahweh is bringing us to himself for a glimpse of time. Brethren and sisters, are we going to understand what Yahweh is trying to do for us and this place that he is trying to take us? And when we understand that, then it will give us the strength through the Spirit to accomplish his words now. Revelation 21, 9. Revelation 21, 9, and there came one of the seven angels who had seven bulls who were loaded with seven last plagues, and he spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride and the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away. Now, this isn't harpazo. This is a physical lifting me up and taking me to another place. He carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high. So he took, the, he took John to a place where he could experience what was taking place in the heavenly realm. And he showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from Elohim, having the glory of Yahweh, her light, which is most precious stone, as it were, jasper stone, clear as crystal. These things are being built right now, a goal that we are all trying to attain. So let's, brethren and sisters, use the final words of John as he wrote this book, the book of Revelation, to meter ourselves so that we can uh, raise ourselves up to a level where Yahweh will save us, transform us out of, this, out of the life we are. Verse 18 of 22, I testify to every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to them, Yahweh shall add to him the plagues that are written in the book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, Yahweh will take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city, which is written in the book. He who testifies these things says, yes, I come quickly. Amen. Come, Master Yahshua. The grace of the sovereign Yahshua, the Messiah, be with all the saints. And that's the point of a revelation, a glimpse of what we will have here on earth in the future so that we can have the strength to overcome this world. Yahweh bless you all, and let's continue onward to Yahweh's kingdom.